you know, I used to think that providing professional service will require you to sort of be, you know, don't be too picky, you know, just like <laughs> um, different kind of product that will require design. But I think yeah. my mentality sort of shifted on that a little bit. If you can create more chance for your company to work with like like-minded teams, mm -hmm. way more chance for your company to create better products, to create yeah. better works. Essentially, building product from design or engineering, even business standpoint, I think it's creative work. It is. It is very, very creative in its nature, where it's really about people interacting with people. What's up, everybody? This is Mike from Polyform Studio, and you are watching Product Lab, the show that explores product strategies of startups through interviews, experiences, and stories with the founders. Today, we are joined by Andy Liu, the founder of Futureform Lab, a boutique venture studio that accelerates startups and emerging brands through design and product creation. So stay tuned as we really dive into a product-centric episode with little hints of Web3. Okay. All right. All right. Let's jump into it then. All right. Andy, rolling. kick things You're off. Rolling. Tell us about Futureform. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So um, Futureform is a boutique venture studio uh, that helps startups and emerging brands um, through design and product creation. So I think what I see the team uh, is specializing in is really like um, sort of like a production or production studio. Yeah. You can treat right. us as like a music production studio where we try to produce the very first album for artists, which is like <laughs> the very first product for startups. Yeah. Um, a lot of our project really has this sort of like zero to one kind of incubation nature. Uh, yeah. And yeah, like we just jump into, you know, the startups or like early brands, you know, in the incubation phase and we build a product and build a design and build a product. And, you know, sometimes we work with them longer. Sometimes we just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, go through the shipping process and we just, you know, work on different things. Then, um, yeah, that's future form. It's, a, it's the a small team right now. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I you know, love, Rick Rubin has been pretty like... popular. Right? Like, <laughs> yes, right? absolutely. He's like talking about like, music and all that. So like, I, I do get a lot of inspiration from that. But like, yeah, I'm happy you resonate on that. Yeah, yeah. Cutting the first album for, <laughs> for a musician is... True. I, I think that's that's interesting for a couple different reasons. One is like, you know, it's all about the collaboration in the studio. Sure. And there's a lot of exploration. But also like the first album a uh you know a music artist cuts is like a lot of times the best album or like the mm -hmm. most honest album sure. you know Probably. and over time it can kind of get commercialized and stuff like that so i think you know there's a lot of that in startups too where the first thing they make is like what they're most passionate and interested about mm -hmm. and then things kind of can get watered down over time with monetization or whatever yeah, um your your background totally. is as a designer. That's how we met. Was working together yep. in design. Uh, okay. But what's it like being a designer who's now kind of on the other side as as a founder? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a journey itself. Um, so early on, when I was working with Adam, you know, um, I think at that time, you know, there are like companies like Meta Lab. Also from mm -hmm. Vancouver, that's also yeah. very inspiring. And, you know, they've been working with startups and all that. I was just like inspired by those type of companies. And I was like, you know, I just want to do something independently. And mm -hmm. and I, you know, started off as a like an independent contractor and then slowly hiring a team and growing a team. I think, you know, it's been many years. Um, but I think definitely there are some, you know, mentality shift and skill set shift. Yes. From like a, a contributor to a manager to an operator of a company. Um, and uh, previously, you know, around two years ago, I also uh, co-founded a uh, venture studio um, called Naria Lab. Mm -hmm. So it's a Web3, you know, driven venture studio. So with that company, which I departed recently, uh, we grew the team in one year from like, you know, two to three to like 25. Uh, wow. It's a it's a massive growth uh, process. Yeah. Um and yeah, like um, just tons of learning. And sometimes you get just, you're just 
you just get forced to learn things. You have you gotta, to. You yeah. got to learn based on, you know, certain conditions that just like throw on your face. Um, That's so true. But yeah, like it's definitely, um, you know, if I were to really give an analogy, it's like, you know, oh, you're wearing different hats and you have yes. to put on different hats at different times and you don't want to, you know, let go of those hats. You just want to keep it in your room. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of it. So like, cause if you lose one of that and you feel like, okay, you know, I'm like wearing new hat, but like, like now wearing other hats, you might get into a mess later on. Oh, um, but, yeah. I feel but like that one, one recommendation is like, don't wear too many hats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So fashion that. faux pas, too many hats. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I feel the same. Yeah. I mean, you know, Mike and I, we're, we're both designer founders as well. And yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real alluring draw to jump back there in Figma oh, once in a while yeah. and yeah. get my hands dirty designing things. But we got to, we got to think about things a little differently. Yeah. What, what yeah. do you think, you know, going from being a product designer, designing products to somebody advising teams, building products and with yeah. the venture studio kind of funding products, do you yeah. think about building a successful product differently now than you did when you were, were just a designer? Oh, totally. I think, you know, my my recent sort of like reflection on that is really you want to be opinionated but also being able to shift your opinion yes you know i think it's a it's a tough balance but i but i think a lot of designers are really frustrated from that because mm -hmm. you know design can also be treated as self-expression to a certain degree and a lot of times senior designers they you know they they get a little bit bad on that but i i think it's you know, creative freedom is so important for, for us, right? Mm. So we, we always want to, you know, put our idea into this solution and, and, and it's always great. But I think, you know, uh, the, the fact that you, if you, if you get the chance to look at how a founder works or, or startup works, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's all, almost like a jazz, right? You know, you have different musicians contributing to the to the song the song is a product and there's different like attributes to that and design is one part of it and i do know that many people talk about that but i think as a designer if you are able to jump out of your own solution just look at a product differently at different phase especially you know in the like the incubation phase building the product is the most important but when it comes to like growth space, maybe operation is like the most important. So like the song, if you, if you, if you see the song as a product will require different kind of like rhythm or mm -hmm. melody, and you will, you will have to learn like different kind of instruments to, to make the song better. Right. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of analogy I'm, I'm trying to use more recently with even my clients and my team that, you know, it, it's a, like building product is like a continuous a iterative process and that's the language in our industry but i think you know it um it definitely requires us to jump out of our you know our toolkits and just like look at other disciplines and 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 contribute and sort of adjust um you know how our contribute differently mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i love the analogy of the band there cuz yeah. like if you have a band that is missing an instrument, it doesn't sound good, you know? And it's yeah. the same with the startup. You have to have all the different contributors, Dude, right? there, I think there's a really good analogy there, right? Where, like, you can have one group of people play one song and yeah. have a different group of people play the same song and have it be, like, to two totally different takes on the same song. And I think that could be the same for, like, a product as well, right? You know, you have, like, this yeah. idea, but, like, it comes down to the execution and the team, you know, that really exactly. make it what it is rather than just this, like, idea that could be, you exactly. know, a game changer. Yeah. So I think last year or two years ago, like, Figma had this, their like annual, like, Fig, Fig conference, you know, like. Yeah. And I think... Dylan Field was really talking about this idea of design is like jamming or design and engineering is like jamming or jazzing. You know, I was like super inspired by that because, you know, go through going through this like, 
you know, multi-year process, like working with engineer, designer, and business people, it it really feels more like you know real than ever mm-hmm. that it is like jamming, and yeah. especially mm-hmm. in a band or ever try to you know co-create some kind of art together. Yeah. Well, like it is true, and yeah. yeah so so you know I, we're I on the same like, page. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and with the jamming part, like, you know, the the people who I know who are in bands, there's kind of like the enthusiast or hobbyist, and they don't jam very regularly. You know, they get together and play like the same kind of like ten songs, and it's wow. just kind of like a small hobby. But then the professional musicians I know, they're playing all the time, and they're playing with one another, and they're expanding their repertoire and that whole kind of idea of like jamming being just like this free flowing kind of expression. It, it's kind of like going to the gym or something almost, right? You're like working on, um, you're working on your skills and you're improving over time. And I think there's like also something really interesting there. I know when we're dealing with like big problems at Polyform, yeah. they get solved in the the best way and often the fastest way if people can like get around a whiteboard and jam on the idea together and not be working in silos you know it takes all these different minds and ideas coming together to mm-hmm. to find the right solution um Hold. yeah some so something i wanted to jam on you with was mm. uh you know speaking of like two bands yeah. playing the same song coming up with different things uh, you know, you've got a lot of real great insights into the international market. And I know, you know, we've yeah. spoke a lot about the journey taking a product from a different market into our market or vice versa. Yeah. Um, you know, h- how does that play into this idea of like two bands playing the same song, getting a different result? Cross culture really requires understanding of the other culture. Um, but I, like one example I can give you is like last year we were working with this like um, Asia-based startup in MR. So what they're doing okay. is they're trying to make this like VR chat type of product, nice. like based on mobile oh, or the okay. Western market, which Whoa. is really interesting. And like just the the fact that you know by getting to the the VR chat user base and just like you know understanding. What the user actually doing is like mind blowing. Not just for like Asian marketers or builders, but also for like North American like you know professionals like me, right? So I think that kind of like cross culture thing is like you 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 really get to learn and empathize with like your users through that, and a lot of times you really have to sort of mitigate your bias or assumptions mm-hmm. in our own language. You know, in our tech language, we treat yeah. it as hypothesis or, or assumption. But I, I really feel like, you know, uh, being able to sort of switch between sort of like this um, previously established assumption about other culture is like important when you're designing for like audience that's so away, far away from you. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You touch on something interesting there. I want to like dive into for a second. Um, building a product for MR mixed reality, yes. you know, kind of a VR chat idea. Um, diving into some of these places where social behavior is happening in VR. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like like VR society has like its own culture? Because oh, I feel like. Yeah. It has the time been. I've spent in VR, <laughs> oh, how people act and interact, it's so different from anything in the real world. Man, yeah. even something like VR chat, I don't, uh, Andy is going to expand on this, but like in like VR chat where you're hidden behind like an avatar as well in like a 3D space, well, that's like another layer, right, yeah. of, of kind of like freedom. Yeah. What's your I take on it? I have some two cents on it because, um, you know, because uh, the product is released. Um, so I can probably expose more information on that. So like, um, what we did, you know, with Asian team is because we're in North America, my team is like English speaking. We will spend like four to five hours in VR every day talking to those users. Wow. Just like chatting. Yeah. Really good chatting because it's almost like, you know, feel research. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And, and the crazy thing is it is like, you know, where you, 
both said is like they actually are from a different world, even though they <laughs> probably live in Vancouver or Canada or somewhere in the States. I think, you know, one quick analogy for at least the VR chat world that I sort of, you know, observe is that it's definitely like a subculture oriented place where, you know, uh, a lot of like heavily addicted users, they, they see some kind of like, you know, it's almost like, I want to say 4chan because it's a bit negative, but like at least like yeah. early day crisis, you know, yeah. there are yeah. users trying to find their own sort of like tribes there. And like, they have so much, you know, they, 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 it's so hard for them to find like, you know, like-minded people in their, mm -hmm. you know, in their towns. Yes. You know, one time we, 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 uh, interview like, a you know, small town American, like college girl, like who, who feel like she's being alienated by her surrounding and she really needs to find friends and she's just good on the VR chat. It's so much easier for her to find those friends who are into like Japanese anime. Yeah, into yeah. Mangas into like games, and and that also felt like the early days of the internet, where yeah, it was a fairly organic way of like talking to people, finding your tribes, and also there's a lot of like, um, I would say, uh, in in VR chat's users sort of own words, um, you know, uh, toxic culture. Yeah, there mm -hmm. where. Yeah. There's some bullying there. There's some, you know, um, just like things you will see in like some high school friend, like in high school kids, they have their emotional sort of like, um, I would say, uh, issues, right? Right. Yeah. It's like almost like exaggerated in the VR space because you don't know who's behind and you can just That's like right. put it out there. So it's, definitely very interesting just to get in there and talk to those users um i'm not sure whether that will be like the key theme in the long run but mm. at least what we're seeing now is that uh for vr chat and other sort of like vr based uh, platform there's definitely a ton of that and it's just interesting to actually analyze it from a cultural perspective mm -hmm. yeah um that's super you know, like use cultural <laughs> oh, that's super cult interesting off, and like, i think you know, talking about internet culture, uh, I know like with Naria Labs as a venture Thank studio, you. you're very focused on uh, Web3. I think that whole area has its own culture. What do you, th what do you see with that culture and its evolution or, or de-evolution through this, uh, this bear market that we're in right now? Yeah, no, that's a great question too. So Alongside with my previous analogy and observation on VR community, I, I personally feel there's something similar in a Web3 community. It's definitely yeah. like, a, like a mixed bag of different kind of like persona type if you really yeah. want to use the design language. Yeah. But I think, you know, the, like the, there's definitely some persona type right there. Like the first one I can think of is, you know, is the NFT, you know, profile holder. Yeah, yeah. Type where they, they care about how they look, they care about their self-identity, and it's a cyber sort of like, it's a cyberpunk or like a cypherpunk type of identity um, focus, which is similar to those VR VR chat users. Just the difference is that they're, you know, NFT holder have way more money. Yeah, I, <laughs> for the most part, yeah. Yeah, but like, I, I kind of feel like they're kind of similar in some sense. I'll, I even want to argue that weirdly, just, you know, something in my brain, I told myself is that, you know, when those VRK users grow up and get more money, they will actually try to buy more NFT. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like a natural progression. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely yeah. like a Venn diagram of these emerging technologies, right? Where yeah. people who are interested in VR and AR and stuff like that, people who are interested in crypto and NFTs, there's there's definitely a lot of overlap there yeah, and, yeah. and digital adoption and you know digital native digital native people you know people who are growing up on the internet and stuff like this um, yeah that's like the first type right and the other type you have is like you know open source issues asked you know like okay. they, they they're like you know hardcore coders engineers they mm -hmm. believe in open source movement which i think is a really great thing and I think it's like the most positive thing coming out from like Web3 community. Yes. Um, 
because like for Naria Labs, we also incubated our own product, which is like a hacker community DAO. It's called Pound No More. I was like the founding designer for that product. And, you know, through that project, we, we talked to a lot of like, you know, why hat hackers, mm -hmm. you know, for all that don't know what is a why hack, why hat ha hackers, they are mostly, you know, the nicer ones, the nicer <laughs> hackers. <laughs> The peaceful the hacker. ethical hackers, right? The ethical hackers, ethical. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it also does remind me of, like, the early sort of, like, Web 2 days where open source movement was, like, so big. You know, you have yeah. companies like Base, Basecamp or certain set of signals. They were, like, early contributor of, like, Ruby on Rails, you know? And I think also, like, the founder of Notion, Ivan Zhao, he's also from Vancouver. I think he was, like, a fairly big open source activist himself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you look at the Web3 community, those hackers, those engineers with the ethical sort of like stance, they're pushing a lot of boundaries right now, even though it's slower than what a lot of people expected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just a hype cycle right there, right? But yeah. my personal take is that they will eventually build something meaningful. Um, despite the market cycle up and down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a, second. a lot of, yeah, a lot of interesting conversation to be had there around the open source enthusiast and the decentralization enthusiast and okay. how those kind of go hand in hand and how, like you said, it, it's taking longer than people expected. Yeah. And I think that is partly the, like, uh, the the de-optimization that goes with decentralization you know when wow. things are centralized they're by nature more optimized mm -hmm. as soon as you decentralize something it becomes less optimized and therefore takes longer to achieve its goal i yeah. think uh, a lot of people are feeling that right now That's, um oh yeah especially yeah web3 space especially yeah like all of these DAOs are kind of like crumbling not not so much like pwn no more but the whole yeah. community is like really a lot of them because um, it's a lot of yeah. work right it's a lot of work to do this stuff. Upkeep. Yeah. but yeah. uh would love to you know talk a little bit about pwn no more because when yeah. you first explained the concept to me i thought it was so cool and i mean i'm a big i'm not a hacker myself i can't code at all but I love yeah. the culture and the concept and That's the like, movie from the 90s. Hackers movie, <laughs> you know, Mr. Uh, Robot type uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, tell yeah, us more wanna... about uh, about that. Sure, project. I can I can give a little context for that. So um, uh, from 20, uh, uh, 2021 to 2022, I was uh, the co-founder of Naira Lab, which is like a venture studio for Web3. So yeah. we work on sort of a client-based project, but we also try to incubate our own products. So, uh, you know, around like half a year into the process, we uh, recruited a hacker uh, partner into our team who was like a, you know, fairly talented um, uh, PhD student uh, in Georgia Tech. And he basically wow. proposed the idea to us, to the three founders, our Naria Labs, that he wanted to, you know, like operate or incubate a, you know, Web3 DAO for Y hat hackers. The early insights was that, um, you know, uh, a lot of hackers, a lot of Y hat hackers, they didn't get enough respect from clients or from like project site where they contribute on a project and the clients would just be like, you know what, we don't want to pay you as much because we think you just worth this much money. But then with Web3 and this entire idea of DAO, you know, um, our hacker in residence realized that there's actually a community opportunity to actually operate this DAO or this community of hackers in a more sort of like transparent and equal fashion. And um, also there's opportunity for product there. So there's opportunity for product market fit yeah. And like a new product idea where uh, uh, a more sort of transparent and and uh, equal sort of um, um, fashion can be achieved through some engineering tweak, you know, mm. between hackers and a project. 
And as you know, like for 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 many Web three products, security is like the the biggest concern, right? It has to be, yeah. Well, so much money are actually pouring into it. So yeah, so like you know, long story short, we 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 evaluated the uh, the product ourselves, and we were like, you know what, let's just build it ourselves. I'm and um, the the you know the the internal building process was definitely exciting, but also you know uh, we 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 were really just learning and mm-hmm. like you know working on client project, but at the same time building our own thing. Um, it took us around like three to four months to actually build the initial product. And also, you know, around like four months into the project, there's like a pivoted time for the product mm-hmm. where, you know, the early sort of concept, the early design was sort of like somewhat validated, but also we learned something new. So the product idea sort of shifted. So if you go to like Pound More website, uh, you will kind of notice that it's like code automation tool right now for Web3. Mm-hmm. So... Definitely, you know, by the time, I think last year this time we were talking about the project, uh, you know, the team's direction and the product direction sort of shifted a little bit. But like, mm-hmm. you know, leveraging white hat hackers, I think was was still the, the main goal of um, of uh, Pound No More. Um, and yeah, so um, I was, very cool. you know, yeah. mainly in charge of like building their, um, the founding design team. Yeah. And then I... I I am more focused on the sort of like future form side of things right now. Nice, yeah. nice. So I don't want to talk too much about Pwn No More. It's a, it's like it's such a crazy concept though, and and I love like the pivot in messaging. So instead of like white yeah. hat hacker for sale, it's like code automation or like co- code improvement. However, you guys had had framed it there, kind of yeah. removes like the scary the scariness <laughs> element of like hacker because like you know people who grew up like in the '90s and '80s, '90s, even the early 2000s, right? There's like this negative connotation associated with just the yeah. term hacking. So so moving away from that. Yeah, um, sure. Taking the, I, I want to move the spotlight back over to Future Form. Sure, and yeah. um, e- e- Andy, earlier you were mentioning you, you guys had been working on kind of this like mobile take on VR chat, like working with this like new team who were looking to yeah. kind of propose like a mixed reality version of VR chat. Yeah. Um, go, taking it back to, to Future Form, what do you guys like? What makes for an ideal product or like an ideal idea ideal startup that you guys are like this is one that we need to take this is who we need to help work with elevate for sure it's uh it's a great question um my personal take is that you know because i've been working you know as a vendor or, or like as a professional service type of person um for many years but i like i think that in a recent year or two especially after you know founding my own product uh, I, I I kind of feel that the best collaboration definitely comes from like a mutual respect and mutual interest. Uh, I would say mutual respect for both team, yeah. making sure you can learn from each other. And I think that happens when you know, you know, you meet you meet a startup team. They have this problem you want to they they want you to solve for them or they need certain help. I think aside from like what you can. You know, fix for them, right? It's like providing skill set and whatnot. You know, this sort of synergy between two people or two two team is so important. Yeah, mm. and I think normally, you know, it, you will realize that if this team is like your type of people, mm-hmm, totally. after one or two meeting or after like two hour like conversation, and I think it's really like meeting friends or, you know, like talking to strangers, you know, or finding like-minded people. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I used to think that providing professional service will require you to sort of be, you know, you know, uh, don't be too picky, you know, just like um, (laughs) different kind of product that will require design. But I think my mentality sort of shifted on that a little bit because I think if you can create more chance for your company to work with like like-minded teams, mm-hmm. way more chance for your company to create better products, to create yeah. better works. And I think yeah. it's it, it's so important because like essentially building product from design or engineering, even business standpoint, I think it's creative work. It is. It is 
very, very creative in its nature, where it's really about people interacting with people. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of chemistry is like often ignored, you know, in yeah. our industry. Yeah. But I, I kind of learned this from like fashion industry. I kind of feel like a lot of those like OGs, you know, like Hiroshi Fujiwara, or even like, you know, acronym founders like Arison Hugh. Arison, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah, like, you know, they kind of care so much about like finding the right type of people to work with and just like learn to say no. Yeah. And I learned, I listened through a lot of their interview. They're like, yeah, you know what? We just try to work on what we really like and we want to just like build product for ourselves. And, you know, if you think about our industry, not that much people really talk about this, but I also think that's so crucial. And I, I believe if you look at like successful product like Stripe, Figma, mm -hmm. or like Notion, right? I think those founders, they, when they try to look for partners or like people to work with, they use the same analogy or, or they use the same strategy. They just don't talk about it, you know? That's so, such a great yeah. highlight thing there. I love the acronym example. I'm a big acronym <laughs> fan and like, oh, cool. yeah. they don't collaborate with anybody. Exactly. Really, you know? yeah. It's like it's so it was, mysterious, right? Yeah, Behind yeah. closed doors. That's a creative yeah. director at Nike for a while. And then like every once in a while, they'll drop some small collab, but it's not, it's not like New Balance or something where they're just like and, anybody. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like yeah. all types of different brands. Um, mm. And it, so it's I a difference between like sticking to your niche and making something that's like super high quality, but only appeals to like the certain market that's into it, versus yeah. making something that maybe has like mass market appeal you know what that is that's designing for the tourist or for the purist right yeah, and those acronym Abloh. guys are all about the purists yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a virtual app yeah. something i will there. add is that yeah something i will add is that it's it's designing for the tourist designing for the purist but also designing for yourself you know oh yeah yeah like designing yeah. for like for yourself which is if you have this chance to work with this company or startup and at the same time, you just want to use this product. That would be like yeah. even more fantastic. Like, because mm -hmm. you can like, you know, dog fooding from day one. Yes. And that yeah. kind of partnership, because, um, um, so we, we've been also partnering with this company called Superus. So it's yeah. like, um, so you can check out superusapp.com, which is like a product we've been helping with for over two years. Um, it's exactly the same story where they, they are building this productivity tool where you can, you know, it's all, so we call that, that the canvas for web native minds. Hmm. So it's, it's still early days, you know, the, it's, uh, it has a little bit buggy issues here and there, but you know, the day I met the founder, he pitched this idea to me. I was like, oh, you like Rome research. You like notion. You want to, you want to work on something like, you know, you know, productivity tool focus, but also, you know, with a bit of a deeper thinking. So first of all, I was like someone who's like really geeky about this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So we just kept on working together for like close to two years. Wow. And we, you know, n nowadays, um, it's mostly my team working on it. And yeah. I kind of like work on the sort of high level strategy and like design review type of things. But like coming back to that design for yourself type of mm -hmm. analogy is like, you know, with that product, I just really want to use it. And yeah. I I can just like, you know, talk to the founder and be like, you know what, why don't we just do this? Because this feature might be cool, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I, Something we do yeah. at, uh, at Polyform a lot is like Ooh, when we true. have a, a new project come in and like, let's say it's to do with music or something, mm -hmm. you know, cool. we'll look at all the designers on the team and oh, say yeah. who's a musician yeah you know who, who loves sense. music and yeah. and they're sure. the ones we assign to the project and we've even like delayed the start times of projects at time to be like That's true. you know we could we could assign somebody to this now but there's somebody we could assign two months from now that is work. just in love with this particular you know genre yeah. or idea and i just know that they're going to get a better outcome because Absolutely. Yeah. they've got this like base of knowledge in their mind about it they've got this passion about it when you sure. put a passionate person with this passionate founder you 
like you said, you get the best results, right? Yeah, yeah they true. care. You know, they, they yeah. carry more sometimes than a founder <laughs> with their own opinion, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I think we're essentially talking about, you know, two different sides of the same coin. I think it doesn't yeah. matter if you're operating as a founder level, operating as a, you know, uh, uh, contributor level, like, it's the same. It's like, you know, uh, you got to have how to find that patch and fit. Yeah. Yes. You kind of care and yeah, to produce yeah. good work. This is why it's like, hmm. you know, part of what we do when we um, exit uh, uh, an engagement with a startup is we help them, you know, find and hire their design team, train them up. And those, those right. first design hires are so important at an early stage startup because they have so yeah. much power, right? They have so much power yeah. to define um, this, you know, the first product for this startup, yeah. which is like the whole heart of this company, right? And wow. if you have a non-designer founder, there can be communication issues there where the, yeah. the founder has an idea, doesn't have the design language to communicate it. So yeah. uh, I think that's, you know bringing design into a startup like you do or bringing the first designer into a into a startup uh as as a first hire it's like okay. such an important part of the puzzle that really defines like success or failure a lot of the time that not enough people talk about yeah For sure all that's about a, the builders uh, yeah yeah that's a cultural setting part right it's like you know cultural is people People is culture. You you have mm -hmm. different people into the team. You probably have a different dynamic and synergy, right? So mm -hmm. that's uh, I think you know, for design oriented founders uh, or you know, people who want to use design or leverage design, I think you know how to sort of you know using how to sort of use our empathy. You know that's a buzzword, mm -hmm. but use that to influence culture. Um, I think that's a uh, you know that's a that's a hidden skill set a lot of designer haven't really uncovered but i think you know our industry should, should sort of focus on that more if mm -hmm. you look at airbnb right like like oh, joe yeah. i think he was like the culture person or also like you know the main guy right the the ceo is also the cu culture person but i think the success from airbnb was like they just get the culture right mm -hmm. you know and yeah. they happen to be like a designer found company yeah. Right. So, yeah. and it's why they stood apart from all of the other, especially when they went about with like the redesign and they're like, we have like this new system that everything Airbnb yeah. follows. Right. And now there's like this, you know, almost like a template for everything. And it just, the synergy was right. there. Um, yeah. so, it, you know, yeah. like a huge difference in, in like a designer founded company like that versus like, I, I don't know any other startup. Maybe it's like founded by somebody with like a business or development background. And that first hire is going to be the person to build mm -hmm. it. Right. We don't even know what it is that we're making yet, but the first hire we make is somebody to build it for us. Yeah. Right. Without the consideration, without the empathy, you know, that you were, you were describing, yeah. uh, Andy, that goes into like making great products. Great. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of yeah. this, like, uh, you know, cultural synergy when you're making a product, something I wanted to like flip to, to a second is like, the you know the design synergies and efforts for hardware products versus just digital because mm -hmm. i know you're somebody who's worked on a handful of iot products over the years with uh, yeah. with future form and stuff like this i know that was kind of like you had a few in the bag at one point that were were super super mm -hmm. interesting um you know what's your take on the difference in the design cycle and thinking and kind of product world of hardware versus software yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, you know, my two cents will be, I think if you really look at the difference, I think you want to respect that when this product is being designed, you don't iterate much, you know? Yeah. It's like shifting your sort of like continuous iteration mindset from like software development to this like, you know, at least you won't be able to iterate it for two years type of mentality. Mm -hmm. And balancing that is definitely important, I think, because, you know, we sort of come from more like software design side, right? Like where we care about like digital experience and how digital experience can influence, 
you know, IoT product experience. Um, I I kind of feel like a lot of times, you know, in, in terms of the actual industrial design and all that kind of knowledge, you want to really listen to the hardware engineers and the industrial designers, you know, expertise. And there yeah. is, you know, coming back to this like jamming analogy where, you know, it's almost like they're playing a different kind of instrument. Mm -hmm. Like at that time, you want to be like, you know what? You can play your instrument and I can just like tell you whether yeah. that sounds good or not. But <laughs> you got to let them take the lead, right? And That's I'm not, right. These are exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like so stepping aside a little bit and just like let, let other kind of designers and like, you know, how, uh, how our engineers do their thing is important. But I think there's also way more common grounds than than difference, I believe, where, you know, I think uh, user experience designers uh, through training, we're, we're definitely, you know, way, you know, way easy, it's way easy for us to sort of look at things from a, you know, this customer journey perspective. So like applying that is definitely what, you know, like US designers are good at. So, mm -hmm. so sort of, you know, you can also add advocating for that kind of like uh, way of working through working with power on um, startups. Yeah. 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 Uh, hardware's I mean, a, a whole other well, game, right? I think it's good, man. You know, like I, I think, w and Andy, you really touched on this, like design is such, it's, it's like a language, you know, that, that spans disciplines. So, you know, the industrial guy is like worried about this. The, the UX guy is worried about this, but I think it all comes back to like the person who's going to be using it, you know, what its use case is. Yeah, tying it back to the customer, right? R regardless of the discipline, um, and yeah. how w and what the use case is behind this thing, you know how people are going to use it. Yeah, that's yeah. like top yeah. consideration. Yeah, yeah. so it's a like, lot of good, a lot of good uh, ground covered in this chat. Um, we are almost at time. <gasps> Something what? we love to do to wrap it up is just kind of like a little lightning round. Lightning. Where we're going to ask a bunch of questions. Okay. Uh, get some, uh, you know, uh, quick quick shot answers for them. Um, I'll start. Okay. What, what's the, what's one of your top SaaS products you're oh. using right now that people might not know about? That's a good one. Okay. So I'm going to do like a, you know, parcel here. I'm using Supras right now. <laughs> here yeah. we go. <laughs> Suprasapp.com. So it's basically like, it's a canvas tool, but you can actually browse information online with its internal browser where you can actually take notes in the browser and that notes can be compiled into, you know, um, your own canvas. So you can, so I use it for note taking. I use it for nice. like doing deep dive learning. Let's say, you know, AI is so hot right now. I want to just read the articles from like, you know, open AI and different yeah. tweets. Right. So I use that app just to take notes for myself to, you know, for deeper reflection. So that's a tool I'll be recommending. Dude, it's a great one. Very nice. Yeah, we got to check that out. All right, Andy, I got a little bit of an unorthodox one for you. So this one, you know, we've been talking about the digital space. We've been talking about tools, SaaS stuff. Let's take it back to the print media, the old, the old paperbacks. What's like a book that you would recommend for, you know, like a first time founder, maybe even somebody making the switch from designer to now being the person in charge? What's like a book that, yeah. that has like really helped you? Yeah. You know, we talk about so much talk about music so much today so yeah. i will recommend like a new book that's coming out from ricky rubin uh, called the creative act a way of being from this legendary music producer ricky oh, rubin it's, yeah uh it's a book about creativity about how to work with other people how to nurture your own creativity and your team's creativity and your client's creativity and how to yeah just do good work and um I read through that, uh, you know, the first week I got it and I've been just like constantly inspired by that. Wow. Oh, what Rick a legend. Rubin, such yeah. a legend as well. Yeah. What a legend. That's a great recommendation. Um, okay. So, so here's another quick one. Uh, I know you work with a lot of startups. We work with a lot of startups. What's yeah. the number one piece of advice that you give to a founder who is a first time founder? Ooh. One 
Yeah. Um, I would say be humbly opinionated mm. in that, you know, like you can be very opinionated about like the stuff you want to create, but like, you know, reality will give you a lesson or two. <laughs> sometimes a lesson, sometimes a bad lesson. Yeah. And, and you will probably realize that your, you know, what you believe so much might not be needed by, you know, the market, but it doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. You know, it probably means that you have to sort of like, um, shift your opinion just a little bit. And that doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're not yourself. You're not, you know, along your path. So, um, have an open mind, but also ready for change. Yeah. That's my advice. Uh. Very good. really good. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? We got time for one more. We got more. time for one more? All right, Andy, I got one for you. Wait. Andy, you l operate in so many interesting circles, like with the Web3, the startup space, even like with what's going on with Pwn No More and kind of like the white hat hackers and like the, yeah. that DAO that those guys are, are doing there. What's like the coolest, most inspiring like Twitter feed that you you follow that you're a part of? Or, or even like a Discord that you're in that you're like, man, I get a ton of inspiration ideas from, from like this kind of community. I, so I'm kind of like, personally speaking, I'm like a geek on menswear. I like no. kind of one of that stuff. So like, I recently like look into, you know, high beast radio. So business of hype. <gasps> nice. Operated by Jeff Dable. Yes. Yeah. They were like talking about like a lot of like brands, you know, like how they got to their success story. It's it's kind of like a fashion equivalent of like how I build this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's so interesting that, you know, a lot of those brands, they talk about their success story. It's like so, you know, it, it, it just can be directly applied to what we do is mm -hmm. at and startup and design driven, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, right. You know, um, and a lot of our community actually don't really know about this and i think i would recommend people who really care to listen to yeah. it high beast uh, ready yeah I love it love, love it. it yeah big high beast <laughs> fans here dude for real uh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, i think you know there's so much innovation going on in that space right now there's so much collaboration going on in this space yeah. right now it's uh it's really an interesting time for that space and there's so many parallels to the startup community, I, I think there's more information and access now in the fashion world than ever before. And yeah. that's created opportunity for newcomers and new collaborations and, you know, niche activities that are maybe just for this one kind of cross pollinated market. So, yeah, I think super, super exciting time there. I would sure. love for the startup space to take a, a cue from the world of streetwear in terms of like the collaborations, you know, what does like yeah. an yeah. Airbnb and headspace collab look like, yeah. you know, yeah. you see like Supreme be, in the North face, you know, that'd be so interesting. And that'd I think be, yeah. like, I think customer nowadays, you know, we don't differentiate them, right? A streetwear user, if you will, a customer, they're also like a notion user, right? Yeah, to like, absolutely. I think they will care about the same thing. They're probably mm -hmm. a web user as well. So like, yeah. You know what is user-centered design here? Why not we just like thinking think about it in a more holistic way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I think as as yeah. the the startup world moves towards more like no code solutions and like the uh, you know secret sauce behind the scenes at a startup mm -hmm. is less important and the brand and kind of lifestyle of the uh, startup becomes more important. We'll see more of this collaborative energy where like people don't feel like they need to keep secret and keep these moats yeah. around their startups as much as they did. Yeah. Um, you know, if you but, see any sort of hints of that happening, can me post it. I'm also interested in like yeah. how that could turn out. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, that's, uh, that's the show. That's product lab Amazing. for today. Thank really you appreciate so much. you being with us, Andy. Thank uh, you so much, Andy. always a pleasure of to go, uh, like, uh, have a coffee and catch up soon yeah swing by the place andy next time you're around yeah, i will love to um 
you know, thanks so much for, you know, this session. Uh, happy to hear more from you guys soon. Absolutely, yeah. dude. Always good to jam with you. Yeah. yeah. Later, Andy. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. That's another episode of Product Lab. Big thanks to our guest, Andy Liu. Big thanks to all of you for tuning in. Please hit the like and subscribe and tune in for the next podcast anywhere you listen. Oh, 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 o